Hi everybody, uh, Jim Bucknell here, aid, aided by my able videographer, uh, Greg Kanker, and today we're going to talk about building a torsion box. Torsion box is just a kind of a thin skinned frame covering over a frame that resists twisting and is dead flat and it makes a great workbench or an auxiliary workbench. Uh, they can come in all sizes, whatever you want to build. Here's one that I built uh, some time ago. Uh, and we'll show you how, how to build it. This is bigger than we're going to do today, but I use this as an auxiliary bench primarily to do uh, my vacuum forming, vacuum veneering on because then while things are in the clamp, it doesn't tie up my other work surfaces. So I set this up on sawhorses and even if the sawhorses aren't level, this is flat. And so you can clamp things to it and work on it and nothing wobbles, tilts or anything. It's a very handy, very handy surface to use. And basically, if you think about a hollow core door, they are essentially a torsion box. They just don't have the, the grid in them, and the skin is so thin that they probably don't stand up well to hammering and that sort of thing. But they, they are essentially a torsion box because they, they're flat and they're, and they're rigid in terms of resisting torsion or twisting. So what I've got here is the makings of a small one that we're going to make today. It's about 16 and a little bit by 28 or so. I cut it out of a half inch Baltic birch and basically set the length just enough that I could get two, the, face, the two faces out of one pass on the table saw because they're five foot by five foot sheets. So then I went and figured out we're going to have five longitudinal pieces or what I call stringers. Uh, the outside ones are running the full length, the cross ones are shorter so they're going to be inside. It could be the opposite however way you want to do it. Then the three inside run from inside to inside, and then they'll be crossed with these, these pieces, which are um, two inches, everything's two inches on this, by about by three and a half, and they'll be placed in like this to form a box grid. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll hook these together, we'll show you how you do that, the, the easiest way that I know of doing that, and then we'll, we'll put one face on, and we'll pin that in a couple of places, and then flip the whole thing over, put glue on the other side, put that one on, and pin that down and then clamp it down. And when it's done, trim the edges and you've got a, a torsion box. So uh, pretty easy to do. I cut a whole bunch of these pieces and I'll, uh, we'll fill out this grid. And then I left the last bay open because it will inevitably be a slightly different dimension than, than all of these. Um, <clears throat> and so I will measure those and then we'll cut the last seven or so for that for that bay and then we'll we'll put the thing together so what I did is again everything everything is two inches so you want to make sure when you set up your saw for whatever thickness you want to go make all the cut all the pieces you're going to need on that setup so if you're two and a sixty fourth you're two and a sixty fourth and you're not having to go back and reset the saw it's just good to even if you have to cut extra, make sure that you cut everything exactly the same thickness because the goal is to have a, a final torsion box that is dead flat on both faces without any ripples or anything because you've got a, a hump or a high spot somewhere. So I labeled the pieces as I was getting them ready. So this one says side one of two. Uh, this one here says uh, stringer. Uh, one of three, so it's if, as the pieces got mixed around later, if they do, I know what's what, um, and it's just a good way to avoid uh, confusion because it's I'm easily confused, <laughs> and that really helps to <clears throat> avoid that whenever possible. So, the next thing we're going to do is um, hand cut mortise and tenons on all these joints, and uh, we'll be back with you in about three months. <laughs> just kidding. Um, when I first read about doing this, I really was sort of skeptical, but uh, what, we're, what we're going to do actually is staple them together, but what I want to start with is securing the outer box around the thing so that we start out with the, the, the proper box and opening. So I'm going to use the Tom Holworth uh, 3D printed bottle opening for, for glue bottles, which is a very handy thing, by the way, and I'm going to just... Um, I'm going to move all these pieces out for the time being and I'm going to quickly put glue on the corners because I just want to anchor that together at the corner. 
Doesn't take a lot. And I'm just going to pin the corners together with my air nailer. Nothing fancy here. This is not fancy woodworking, but it really does work. Okay, now I'm going to just check it for square. It's got to be close and we can flex it a little bit if we, if we need to. 32 and a half there. 27 and 8 here, perfect. <laughs> no, it is square. So <laughs> luck is with me today. So that's, that's a good start. So, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and insert these stringers. And I'm going to put a bit of glue on them as well. I'm just going to glue a couple of them because I'm not going to glue all of them because I wanted to show you a couple of ways of doing this. You can certainly go in and, and glue these um, like so. You want to get the spacing right so that you know you've got it where you, where you want it. Okay, so you pull it in there like that. It's always good to have a good, comfortable work position. So I'll go ahead and just glue these in, but we could just staple them. As you're going to see in a few minutes, we're just going to use a stapler for uh, the bulk of the connecting that we're going to be doing, which when I first did this, I just thought, no way, that is just not going to work. But guess what? It does. And so uh, it actually works really well. We get so used to doing fancy joinery and, you know, using Festool dominoes and things like that. That sometimes when you don't need to do any of that, you go, that can't be right. But that uh, sometimes it works. So there we go, it's the second one there. And you can start to see why you want every piece to be, all these pieces to be consistent length and consistent width. And, and how if you're if they aren't you're going to be uh, having some difficulties as you go through the entire process so it it really is important to get that first step done as accurately uh, as you can do it it's like building a house foundation if you don't get the foundation correct you're going to fight it the rest of the way okay so <clears throat> That's basically all the air nailing we're going to do. The rest of it is just to put these spacers in and anchor them so that they go straight across and they don't even actually have to be straight across from each other. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter. And I'm gonna use an electric stapler because I'm wearing thumb braces and I have arthritis in my hands and my wrists. And this is a lot easier than squeezing a stapler about a million times. And so all you really do is just go down here and you staple across that joint and sometimes you actually hit the wood uh, which is good and so we'll do that about a million times and they're anchored in there now and, th and that'll be fine the fact that they can rotate a little bit will be taken care of when the they get glued okay so I've been busily uh, putting together the grid and I've used all the pieces that I had so far and I've gone around and I've hammered them and flush like that make sure that they're not any big bumps I often go over it with a like a putty knife or something you'll hear it click but it, if it doesn't hang up you're uh, you're good if you don't come to a sudden screeching halt you're you're okay if you haven't missed it all so I do that just to double check so now as I said before we're going to measure this bay and cut the other eight to go in here and then we'll be ready to put the, the skin on so uh, I wanted to show how you how I cut the pieces on the chop saw so they're all precisely the same length so uh, we'll move over there and, and, and do that okay whenever I'm cutting multiple pieces on the chop saw and I want them to be the same exact length which is usually the case I if I'm cutting 
more than one, uh, I use a stop block because then they're going to be the same length. And all you, then the key is just setting the chop block at the right spot and you'll get a bunch of pieces, however many you need, of the, of the right length. Not many people trust these rulers, but I use it all the time on this because it's flat and rigid and it, uh, it, it works fine. So I want to have slightly under three and a quarter inch pieces. So what I do is I set this down and I trap the, the uh, stick with the, the teeth of the blade. And then I slide my stop block over to that and it's got a relief on the bottom for uh, relieving for sawdust so you don't get chips in there which can throw off your cuts. So I line that up with that, just move this, hold this in place, and clamp it against the fence. And now I can run my pieces in against the fence and cut them and they'll all be exactly the same length. Now you're in here pretty close to the blade, so if you're not comfortable with that, then I use this fast cap. Uh, Tool. It's called the million dollar stick, I think. They call it that because if you avoid cutting off your fingers, it was worth a million dollars or, or something like that. Anyway, so that's what I use to hold it. I'm going to turn the dust control on and go ahead and cut eight pieces. I'll cut one, step out of the camera for a minute, make sure it fits, and then, and then come back and cut the rest. It worked! <laughs> okay, so we're back. I've got the pieces all cut, and I just like to go over them with a little sandpaper just real quickly, just to knock the, the fuzz off the edges, just so it doesn't get in the way, and it just kind of bothers me if you see that stuff, so I guess I'm fussy about that. But we've got all our pieces now, and so again, we'll just start placing them in into the grid like we did before, and staple those in, and then we'll be ready to uh, to flip it over or glue it and start putting it together. So here we go again. stapled together, but look at that, it's already pretty solid. It's only glued at the corners and at the ends, and it's, uh, you can see it's pretty, pretty rigid already. In fact, it's very rigid already. So that's what we're after. So with that, the next thing you do is just put glue along here and, and then glue the, other, glue the first face on, and then I'm going to just tack it at the corner with pins so we can flip it over, and then we glue the other side and then we clamp it. Now, a lot of times, because I, I have a vacuum bag, I would put it in the vacuum press to do that, and we may actually do a, a VST about some vacuum uh, applications uh, here in the, in the not-too-distant future. But um, for today, we'll just use uh, clamps and a call to, uh, to clamp it up and let it sit for about an hour, and then you just uh, use a router bit to trim the edges flush and uh, round them over a little bit if you want and uh, that's pretty much it and then what I did on mine is I put several coats of shellac on it just so that if I'm gluing up glue doesn't stick to it and you can pop stuff off and then I've also tried to keep a, a good side and a bad side so if I'm doing something staining something something like that um, where it might get messed up it all sort of happens on one side and whether I'll be successful at really keeping it that way, we'll see. But that, that was the, the idea, because the both sides should be identical and perfectly good for whatever you're going to do with it. So with that, we will go ahead and start applying glue. And this is where whatever project you're doing seems bigger than, you're, than it really is when you're doing this kind of stuff. Like my wife says, when I complain about the size of my shop that it's too small, she says, yeah, go clean the roof. Um, and that always takes care of my, <laughs> my complaint.
and I'm just using tight bond three. That's what I use most of the time, but any of the any of the glues would work. Except maybe the instant glue. <laughs> That'd be a problem. <laughs> okay. Put this down, and this should be just slightly proud of the surface if it's all turning out the right the right way. So we can trim it a little bit with a router bit. So uh, that's feeling pretty good. So again, I'm just going to pin it so that it doesn't move when we tip it. Okay. Hey, that looks just like the other side. <laughs> okay, gluing again. And if you want to staple these sides of them too, you can. But when you clamp it down, they'll all get anchored and flatten out um, because of the, the clamping pressure. So. I think you're uh, you're fine without doing that. Now, if you didn't have clamps, or if you want to clamp it down, uh, you could go around and have marked your grid and. Okay, so we took a break because the air compressor started right in the middle of the presentation, so, so we paused, but now we're back. And so I've started clamping this up, and I'm just putting these clamps uh, spaced along the side. And uh, I've got a damp rag here somewhere that I used to wipe off some of the, the squeeze out. I didn't put a lot of glue on, so we're not really getting much in the way of squeeze out. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do is I built this, I uh, made this clamping call, which I just planed off with the hand plane from each edge so that it rocks a little bit. And if you put that sort of down the middle and clamp it in, it'll put it'll put pressure in the in the middle of the of the piece. Put that on like that, and you see this is this is up. So as you clamp that down, it puts pressure across the middle. So that's down. I'll get one more clamp for here, and I think we're clamped. And then I'll uh, wipe it down with a damp rag to get the squeeze out out and then we'll just let it dry for an hour or so and should be good to go. We'll have a torsion box and then we'll, like I say, go around and clean up the edges a little bit and then ultimately put a couple of coats of shellac or polyurethane or something on it to keep things from sticking to it and that will be a torsion box. So we'll be back in a little bit. Okay, um, I'm just going to show you another way of making a grid. Uh, some advantages and disadvantages, but uh, it's, it's doing it using dados. So you're going to end up with strips like this, and uh, of course they will fit together like so. So in doing this, uh, the easiest way is to make a, a shop built jig like this. And what I've done here is First of all, cut all of your strips, the material you're going to use for your strips, and uh, also the key material um, ahead of time uh, using your regular blade before you put your, your dado blade on. And what I've done is the key material is slightly less high you know, quite slightly narrower than the dados that I'm putting into these strips. That's so that, and this is the key material is what I made this out of, that is so that when you go over it like so, you're not taking any chance of a little piece of wood or something, you know, a scrap or something getting in there and hanging you up and not having the, the strip, uh, the grid strip, go all the way down to the uh, surface of the table saw. So, what you do is you initially make a cut near the end and have the height adjusted on the uh, dado set so that you're at the proper height for your key material. Make a single pass through and glue in your key. At that point, 
The next step would be to hold your fence in place and slide it left and right. What you're going to do is you're going to adjust it for a specific uh, spacing on your internal grid. I decided to make mine uh, four inches. So I measured four inches between this point here, the, what would be the, this side of the dado set and the inside here of the key. I set that and I make a line. You probably might be able to see it still here. That's at four inches. Then I raise the dado set, and I'm not on my saw. This is set up spacing-wise for Jim's saw here. So I put a piece of ta tape over this here. These lines represent where the 3 8 inch uh, dado set would be. So you can see it's lined up with the dado that I have cut through here already. But at this point in time, this would not be here. You would have a solid fence. So what I would do is, where that line comes, my 4 inch mark, I'd raise the dado set slightly, take a tooth on the set, and line it up with the line, hold it in place, and screw in the fence to the miter gauge. So now I have that spacing locked in. At that point, what you're going to do, I'm going to put this piece, well, I'm going to borrow a piece here. This isn't the right height, of course, but just to show the idea, I'm going to put a, a block right even with the dado that we've cut, this side of the dado, and I'm going to clamp it in place. I'm going to move the strips over, and imagine these strips as not having any of the dados in them. As you move it over and you run it through, what you're doing is you're cutting this edge, Definitely. this notch of, the, uh, of each strip. And you do it for every one of the strips. So that's your starting point. Once you've got that done, you've just cut that. You just slide it over, over the key, run it through again. Drop it on, on the key again like that, run it through again, and then for the notch on the other side, you run it through again, and you do that for every one of your strips. And that's how we get the spacing uh, accurately and consistently. Now I'm going to take this out and uh, set it aside, and just go over briefly the process here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two of these and do them initially. In fact, I'll even do one at a time. Uh, we'll make a point here that it's very important that you get your dado set set up for the exact spacing, the exact thickness of your material. In this case it was 3 8 inch Baltic birch, but it was under 3 8 actually. So I ended up using uh, uh, going the next size down on the dado set and using some shims to get it uh, to, to have a snug but not too tight fit. Um, one thing, if you, if you do get it too tight, you can always take a, a sanding block or if you have a drum sander, run it through and just take a light little bit off to, to make the perfect fit. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put a couple more of these in. It's a little harder when you're getting multiples in at a time. I'm trying to fit it in two, two slots. So we'll do the next one here. And we've got the internal portion done now. Almost. There we go. So in doing the ends, the corners, we'll just put it over and put it under and and at that point you can either choose to uh, put a brad in there, a, a, you know, a pin nailer or something like that, or you can leave it uh, because you're going to be solid enough. Uh, you put your glue on, you put your your skin on top. But what I would do it me probably put a little bit of glue on a couple of these joints. If you just do a, a couple of joints, like I did this one uh, as an uh, example, it is just rock solid. 
And so all you need to do is have a couple of key points in there uh, and, and the grid is going to be locked in. And at that point I would do the same thing to the, the corners here. Uh, from that point on you're doing the same thing we did here. Um, I will add that there's one other thing that you could do on the top. Um, after you flush trim the top and bottom of the sides, uh, on the sides here, you flush trim the sides, uh, if you so desired, you could put a piece of hardboard on top, screwed, not glued, in place to one of the internal uh, grids, and then you could put hardwood or something, you know, after you flush trim it, you could put hardwood on the side so that you'd have a replaceable top. Uh, kind of handy if you do intend to use it for finishing and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that wraps this up.